In December of 1907, there was a terrible mining uh, explosion uh, in West Virginia. And in that explosion, there were more than 360 uh, men who lost their lives. Uh, most of these men were family men, uh, leaving 1,000 children without fathers. During that time, there was a woman by the name of Grace Clayton who was distraught at the thought of all these children, children of having to, to live out their lives without their fathers. And she thought there's something that we need to do. And she went to her, her uh, minister there at the Methodist church that she attended and she asked him if they could uh, observe uh, a Father's Day Sunday. And to uh, which he agreed, and since her father was also a Methodist minister, she chose uh, to use the, the day that he was uh, uh, born as the day that they would celebrate this. So on July the 5th, 1908, the first Father's Day sermon was preached. But it really didn't go very far. It, it pretty much stayed in this uh, small uh, community, Fairmont, West Virginia, uh, in this Memorial Methodist Church, Episcopal Church South, actually, at that time, uh, but didn't move very much. And talking with the historians of, of Fairmont, West Virginia, they say it was really a Sonora God who uh, promoted Father's Day uh, years, a few years later. The fact was, in 1909, she was in her uh, church, Central uh, Methodist Church, in Spokane, Washington, 2,000 miles away uh, from the other church, and she was listening to a Mother's Day sermon when she got the idea that, you know, we need to honor uh, fathers. Because her father died some 11 years earlier, and it was her father who raised the six kids of the family, uh, the ones who, one who taught them the ways of life, the one who cared for them and protected for them, uh, and who, who loved them. And so she chose uh, her father's birthday, uh, which was in June, and so they celebrated the first Father's Day celebration in Spokane, Washington, uh, on June the 19th, 1910. Uh, many presidents recognized and promoted uh, and authorized uh, Father's Day, but you know, it wasn't until 1972 when Richard Nixon uh, signed it into law that Father's Day became a national uh, holiday to celebrate fathers. So here we are today uh, because two women in two different Methodist churches 2,000 miles from each other uh, had this idea that we need to, to celebrate fathers and father figures. I looked in the Webster, Webster's Dictionary and Webster lists seven definitions of what a father uh, is. Webster defines a father as a man who has begotten a child. Number two, the male parent, a protector. Number three, one who looks after or cares for as a father does. Number four, one who takes responsible uh, responsibility for. Number five, a forefather or an ancestor. Number six, an originator, founder, or inventor. And number seven, God. Now, if you look at this list, you'll notice that Webster begins his list with the minimal requirement of what a father is, and then go, uh, and that is just begotten a child, uh, and then goes to the uh, the extreme, the ultimate father, the one that that uh, uh, who has begotten us, the one who formed us from the dust of the ground and breathed into us the breath of life. Uh, the one who protects us, the one who cares after us, looks after us, uh, one who takes responsibility for us, our originator, our founder, our inventor, God Almighty. But what happens? What happens 
during the times when your father didn't protect, didn't care for you in the way that you thought your father should have, the times when you uh, were lost, or you were abandoned, or you got hurt, or you failed uh, in some way. What about the time uh, when it appears that God sleeps? The fourth chapter of Mark's Gospel has a little bit to say about that. So if you'll turn with me to Mark chapter 4, and we will look at verses 35 through 41 this morning. Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 35. Hear the word of the Lord. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with him in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. And a great storm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and, and the sea and said, Peace be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, most biblical, biblical scholars date the Gospel of Mark between the decade of AD 65 and, and 75. And uh, the, therefore, the historical context uh, from which Mark writes that could be in the midst of the great Jewish revolt uh, which took place in the years 66 to 70. Now this was a time uh, of great turmoil for the early church. Uh, a time when, when the church and, and Christianity suffered greatly. It was a time when they were under the persecution of Nero. Jerusalem was burned to the ground. The temple was destroyed. Not one stone left upon another, uh, the scripture says. These were stormy times uh, for the disciples in the early church. Uh, many were put to death. It was a time when it appeared that, that God might be sleeping, if you will. But Mark draws from the literary context of an experience that Jesus had with his disciples on the Sea of Galilee around the, the year 30. In order to offer hope and encouragement, in order to, to build faith into the early church during this time and everything that they were going through and, and us as well, hopefully. The immediate context of our writing this morning uh, comes from the parable of the sower. It actually begins in verse 1 uh, in chapter 4, leading up to this point where when Jesus talks about the parables of the sower, uh, sowing the word of God into people, sowing, sowing faith into people is what Jesus uh, is trying to uh, explain. And he says that sometimes it falls on fertile soil and, and it grows and, and, and produces a bumper crop and Sometimes it falls on the hard ground and, it, and uh, if it comes up at all then, then it just dies because of the heat of the sun. And then sometimes it, it, the seed falls in the thorns and it gets choked out and it doesn't have a chance. But it's Mark's desire that our text this morning will, will sow seeds of faith in the hearts of the people. Of the disciples. And us as readers of this uh, centuries later. Just as, as Jesus spent the day teaching uh, the parable. Then he left. He left the Jewish side of the Sea of Galilee. And he asked the disciples to go with him to the Gentile side of the uh, Sea of Galilee. That they might, 
they might sow some seeds over there as well. But you see, if you're going to, uh, if you're going somewhere to sow seeds of faith, you better have some faith uh, when you get there to sow. And it could be that what happens in the middle of the seed on that night just might be what the disciples needed to experience in order to equip them for ministry on the other side. Are you with me? Sometimes we have to go through a storm so when we get on the other side, we'll have something to, to sow into someone else's life. That's why we have divorce recovery workshops where divorced people minister to divorced people. That's why we have grief uh, uh, recovery uh, for those going through some kind of a grief. That's why we have alcohol, uh, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous so other alcoholics can, can teach others. So the disciples, they're going through the sea. They're going from one side to the other, and they get caught in the midst of the storm. So possibly it's, it, the reason this takes place is because they need to experience something here that when they get to the other side, they'll have something to share. Maybe what they want to, what Mark wants them to know is that the faith that Jesus has is, is a faith that would allow him to be able to rest easy in the midst of a storm. Can you rest easy in the midst of a storm? Some of us can. Uh, some of us maybe not. I want you to understand that, that in our text, at least four of the disciples are pretty experienced in, uh, in boating and in fishing. This is not their first time on the Sea of Galilee. They're no strangers to the sea. They're no strangers to, to storms. But this is no average storm we have in our text. Mark says in verse 37, the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already uh, being swamped. So get this picture in your mind. Uh, the disciples are in a life-threatening situation here. It's night uh, in the midst of the storm, so there's no moon, uh, there's no stars, their lantern was probably swamped, it's probably pitch dark. In the middle of nowhere. They can't see this way and they can't see that way. They can't even see the hands in front of them. And folks, when you are in the depths of your storm and you can't see anything around you but your storm, that's when we're at our worst. That's when we're most vulnerable. That's when uh, real fear sets in. That's when the what-ifs start working on us. That's when all hope seems to be lost. We don't know what to do. It. And what happens is we begin to sink. We begin to sink in our storm. When they tried everything possible in their own strength and nothing worked, then someone remembered that Jesus was asleep in the boat. Isn't that just like us? We'll try to do everything possible on our own strength before we cry out to the Lord. We'll try to do everything uh, our own self before we call upon God to intervene. Second Chronicles 15.2 says, The Lord is with you while you are with Him. If you seek Him, He will be found by you. But if you abandon Him, He will abandon you. Now understand, I don't think God really ever abandons us. But it might seem that way to us. Mark says that, that all this time, the son of the living God was in the back of the boat asleep on a cushion. Now I just can't hardly believe that. If this boat was being tossed this way and that way and being almost swamped to the point of sinking, sinking and you think Jesus is back there asleep? Not a chance. Not a chance. But perhaps, perhaps Jesus was just waiting. He's probably getting soft and wet and thinking, how long am I going to have to lay here in this water <laughs> until they crawl, call out to me so I can help them? That's probably what he's thinking. But he 
he's back there on the cushion, and he's waiting, and he's waiting, and they're fighting, and they're fighting, and then finally, they call out. I want you to notice that, that Jesus didn't uh, make everyone go through this storm. You know, there were other boats, the scripture says. There were others on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. No, Jesus invited the disciples to leave the crowd and go to the Jewish side, or from the Jewish side and go to the Gentile side. This was the perfect storm. I'm not saying that, that God caused this storm. I'm saying that, that God might have allowed uh, this storm. The God of the wind and the sea allowed this storm, this event, to, to play itself out, to run its natural course in the midst of the Sea of Galilee. Sometimes, in order to build the kind of faith that Jesus exhibited in our text, uh, we have to experience a storm in our life. But we need to always remember that we're never alone uh, in the storm. And when it appears that God is asleep, Maybe, maybe this is a teaching moment. Maybe this is a time that we need to pause and say, okay, God, what do you want me to learn from this? What are you trying to tell me through this? Bishop Will Willimon of the North Alabama Conference uh, says that faith means the willingness, even the eagerness, to be with God as God is, rather than as God would have us be. We don't... Uh, mold God to fit into our lives, to fit into our situations, our circumstances. God molds us. God fashions us. God prepares us. God equips us to live life in the midst of a world that is imperfect. We had the shooting in Charleston this week because it's an imperfect world. And there are storms, whether we like them or not. And we can either ride out the storm and learn something from it, or we can sink in the storm. But Mark's hope is that we would take Jesus' experience and learn from it and come out on the other side stronger than we were when we went in. That we might be able to share uh, seeds of faith with someone else. Like the disciples in Mark's community, we don't get to pick and choose the storms. Uh, but we do get to pick who we want to sail with. We get to pick and choose in whose boat we ride in. I don't believe that when storms arise in our lives that it's because God's asleep. But I do believe God may wait to act in our lives until we call out and acknowledge Him. And when He does act, we may, even, we may not even like the response or the way He acts. But that calls for seeds of faith. That calls for us to, to trust. You know, Father's Day began in 1907 because a thousand children were left fatherless. From a mine explosion in West Virginia. Father's Day began because uh, Sonora Dodd uh, had to be raised by her father and her five siblings had to be raised by her father. Uh, he, had to, he had to do double duty. He took the mother's role and the father's role. A father is much more than one who has begotten a child. It doesn't take a lot of effort to do that. Sometimes a father has to do double duty, fill many roles uh, in life, even to allow his children to go through some tough situations in life so they can learn uh, from them, experience some storms, if you will. But you know the good news, the good news that I really want to leave you with here today is whether calm or, or stormy, we have the opportunity to sail with the Father of the wind and the sea. We have the opportunity to sail with the Father who has the power over the wind and the sea, controls the wind and the sea. 
And maybe, just maybe, uh, this Father is waiting for us to just call, to cry out, to reach out, and acknowledge Him and who He is in our life. Let us pray. Almighty Father, we thank You. We thank You for the disciples and the experience of the storm. We thank You for the early church, which Mark writes, who are uh, experiencing some stormy times. Because now we can relate to the storms that we go through. And as they came out on the other side, we too can come out on the other side. Help us to put our faith, hope, and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is uh, found on page 77, How Great Thou Art. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4. But this is our invitational hymn. I want you to know, as always, the altar remains open for you to come and pray if you'd like. If you want me to pray with you, just motion to me and I'll, I'll come and pray with you. Otherwise, I'll respect your privacy. But this is your moment, as I always say. This is your moment to, to uh, kind of put everything that you've experienced here this morning together and to stand and sing or, or sit and meditate or however you want to respond. This is for you. So those who would like, you stand as we sing.